broken so many bones and torn muscles, fat lips, black eyes, you name it, I've had it. Hey there, thanks for tuning in. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 274. And today, we bring you our conversation with Coach Kathy Long. If you're new to the show, I want you to head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Look for the show notes there. Sign up for a newsletter. You can jump on a link over to whistlekick.com where you can find all of our products like our apparel, our sparring gear, kicking paddles, so much more. And we've always got new stuff in the works. You know, most of us are afraid of dying. But our guest today had a glimpse of what was on the other side. Coach Kathy Long had a near-death experience as a child, and it had a profound impact on her beliefs, on the way she lived her life. Coach Kat, as she asked I call her, has varied skill sets and passions, and some of them are completely outside the realm of martial arts. She has a lot of great stories to tell, and I can't wait for you to hear them all. Let's welcome her to the show. Coach Kat, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hi, Jeremy. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Good. I'm very good. Very good. That's that's better than good. Why are you very good by default, or is there is there a reason you're very good? Um, I, I would say by default, but that would should also require an explanation. I think because, um, just because I'm enjoying this experience on this earth, and you know, every day is a is a an interesting lesson. Have you always been that way? A, yeah, pretty much. Cool. I mean, I've I've gone through you know hell and back several times in my lifetime, in this lifetime, and um, you know it's all in your perspective, literally. Is that is that something that comes in when you're training or or when you're when you're coaching people? Uh, well, then, and every other aspect of my life, and really? everything okay. else that I do. What? Hmm. I'm not sure. Where does that come from for you? Is that something that you you learned on your own, or you were lucky enough to have someone teach you that early on? It, it's not a perspective that I'm used to a lot of people having. I have folks in my life that have that perspective, and I aspire to have it. I, I try to work on it, but I'm curious where that came from for you. I was fortunate enough to have died when I was 10 years old. I drowned in a pool, and that experience uh, it was just deeply profound and enlightening. And, you know, it, we have, we have our, our man mind, or you can call it your monkey mind, your ego mind, <clears throat> however you want to put it, um, as a lower vibrational being we're here on this planet, uh, or you have your God mind. You were connected to source in your higher self. And, you know, I try not to bring into religion because religion was definitely man-made and written by man, which is, means it's written by his ego. So from what I experienced, because I know who I am and I, I can reconnect and, and ground myself and come back to center and, and be present and understand that it's the experience that I asked for, no matter what it is. It's what I asked for. Are you willing to tell us a little bit more about that experience with the pool? Sure, that, absolutely. That's, that's not a story that most people have. Um, no, not too many. Yeah. Well, I was. Uh, I had just moved. My family and I had just moved. I was only ten, so I couldn't move by myself. But we moved to a new trailer park, a new area, and it was a trailer park that had a nice pool. When I moved, it was April. I had just turned 10, and the pool was closed until after school. After school was out that summer, and I had never learned how to swim. And I think the couple weeks into it, uh, I'm, I'm in the pool with a bunch of other kids and adults, and you know we're all playing with the big, giant beach ball. And I don't know these kids, and they don't know me, but you know we're all just playing and having a good time. Beach ball got bounced into the deep end of the pool, and I was on the edge of it trying to scoop the ball toward me. And another child just playfully ran by and shoved me in. He didn't know that I didn't know how to swim. And he ended up grabbing the ball and continuing to play. And it was one of those 
odd perfect storm moments where there were plenty of adults there who were sunbathing and plenty of kids playing who didn't notice me. And I tried to come to the surface several times to gasp for air and try to say something. And I think the fourth or fifth time I, I tried to get to the surface of the water and take in some air, it ended up being water instead and it just flooded into my lungs. And when that happens, of course, you try to take another breath because <laughs> water's flowing in. And I, I've never in my entire life, I've broken so many bones and torn muscles, fat lips, black eyes, you name it, I've had it. Nothing compares to the pain of, of fluid flowing into your lungs. I truly do understand how fish feel. And I remember spasming. My whole body was convulsing. And, I, you know, just experiencing that immense amount of pain. And then everything just went black. And then I was, I don't know, about 20 feet above the pool looking down, watching myself floating in the water while everybody's playing. And uh, I watched a woman walk out of a trailer, cross the street, walk into the pool area. And because she was a former lifeguard, she, by habit, uh, would scan the pool. She saw me, ran, dove in, grabbed me, pulled me to the edge, and was yelling for somebody to pull me out of the water. <clears throat> when that happened, I, I, I just went into a different realm. You know, I experienced meeting God and one of the masters we call Jesus, and seeing angels and knowing who I was and reconnecting with Source and and who I am, and. I was told quite a few things, had quite a few things explained to me. I reacquainted myself with why, you know, I, I'm to be here and and had the choice to stay or come back. I chose to come back. Although I hated being back in that little 10-year-old body, hated it. Um, when she was first reviving me and she's speaking to me, I, I couldn't understand her. It, it was as if she was speaking a different language. And it took me a while, and I, I chose not to speak to her. She kept saying, we've got to get you to the hospital. You've got too much fluid in your lungs. You're going to drown. And she's asking everybody around, do you know this girl? No, we don't know her. You know, do you live here? And I just, I wouldn't answer her because I, I just figured if I got taken home and they had to take me to the hospital, I would get in a lot of trouble. So I figured they wouldn't let me back in the pool again. So I just decided not to say anything. And from that point on, I, I've just been, I, I guess, very in touch with intuition, very in touch with people's intentions. I can look somebody in the eye and, and understand what drives them, whether it's fear or, or love. And sometimes I, I wish I wouldn't see that. But um, I, I can tell who somebody is looking at them in a fraction of a second. I can most of the time uh, that's very nice. Sometimes mm. it isn't. What, what? What? When is it not nice? Well, when you see somebody who is who is so insecure or so um, self-hating that they emanate that out, they, they project that out to everybody around them. And because they hate themselves so much or because they're so insecure, because they're so shy, because they're so um, doubtful of anything that they can do, they project that out and it's constantly going on. And, and sometimes there are some deep perversions that people have and you know, it all stems from the way they decide to view things. When you were above your body, you know, I, I can imagine, I can only imagine because I haven't had this experience. It might be easy in that moment to look at the people that were around you that didn't notice you and maybe have some frustration, some anger towards them. Ah, no, no, I was quite, quite at peace. I was very happy. I, I was neutral let's put it that way i think that's probably the best way to explain it i was just quite neutral and just observing what was going on 
the thought never occurred to me to be angry at those kids for pushing me in because they didn't know. They had no idea who I was or whether or not I could swim. And and they were just playing. They're just being kids. And there's nothing to be upset about. Have you ever felt any anger at that situation? At that situation? Yeah, as you look back, you know, you know, as you... I, I don't back. know that I would describe it as anger, but I would certainly say that being back inside that very limiting physical being and being back into knowing that the limitations are, are you know, obviously what I place on myself. However, um, as a being in, in this earth, we're bound by the quote unquote physical laws, if we, you know, as we choose to be. Because that's how we're grown. That's how we grow up. That's what we learn. That's what we believe. And you know, it, it in a lot of ways changed my belief system. Um, but I also know that I'm here, and experientially, it's it's to experience is one of the reasons we're here, so that we may know ourselves in a different light. For people out there that might not know your your competition career. One of the things as I look over the things that you've done is some of them kind of, let's, let's say, defy what people would typically say can be done. You know, some, some of your, your, your competition, and I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but some of the, your competition at certain ages. As you talk about your, your physical body, you're talking about it with respect to it being limiting. Has any of your competition, have any of the physical things you've pursued been an attempt to defy your body? Nope, not at all. Not at all. I, I think I was blessed with good genetics and an extremely strong willpower in that I had a trainer who was my boyfriend at the time, who was also a Marine. So he understood all too well the classic brainwashing techniques that they do with you in boot camp and in basic training, where they overload you with responsibilities. They don't feed you very much. They don't let you sleep very much. And they're constantly drilling the same message in your head over and over and over to break you down functionally. That's why they do that. Um, but when it came to the physical part of it, I ended up, and I'm, I'm not bragging, but I'm just saying what happened at the time I just had the ability to do more than any other fighter that he trained could do in that I did a thousand push-ups a day. I would do hell days and people would end up throwing up in the middle of hell day and they would be allowed to sit down and sit it out where I had to continue. I had no, I had no choice. I had no choice. And, you know, once we decided, I mean, I took, I took my very first fight after 10 days of learning how. I got challenged by a girl doing karate to a kickboxing match, which she had also done. She'd been doing it for two years. She weighed 190 pounds, and I weighed 120. And um, after 10 days of learning how, we beat the snot out of each other. But I discovered an awful lot about myself. Why would you take that fight? Well, because I would go to these tournaments, and in Kung Fu Sun Tzu, we stick our fingers knuckle, knuckle deep in people's eyes and we rupture their testicles and we stomp on their knee and we do things that are highly effective, but you don't compete with them unless you happen to be attacked, which is not terribly common. But um, she would constantly ask me to compete against her in point fighting. And I said, look, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see the value in that. I see a lot of bad habits in that. I mean, there are some good habits, but there are some also bad habits, and I don't, I don't agree with it, so I'm not going to compete with you in that. If you want to step outside and fight, that was my attitude back then, <laughs> because she would constantly nag me. And I said, look, if you want to step out back and fight, let's fight. She would never do that. So um, her instructor called my instructor and asked if I'd be willing to do an exhibition, quote-unquote, kickboxing match with her, because... Because of the weight difference, because she weighed 190, she'd been doing it for two years, and I'd never done it. So he asked me, my, my trainer asked me, and I said, yeah, I'll do it. Because I knew what she wanted to do. She wanted an opportunity to beat the snot out of me, and I thought, all right, here we go. Let's do it. 
was there was there some kind of rivalry or bad blood? I mean, it sounds like there's more to why she would she wanna... didn't care. Yeah, she didn't care for the fact that I would not compete against her in point fighting because I called it, you know, I did I didn't care for it. I said, look, you know, I don't like this type of fighting. I think it's useless and has no meaning and there's no point to it. So I don't want to do it. If you want to step outside and fight, I told her, let's step outside and fight. Outside of this ring, outside of this building. If you want to fight, let's do that. She wouldn't do it. So she didn't care for me too much. And so kickboxing was the compromise. I, 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 would, I would suspect. <laughs> At the time, I didn't know what was going through her head. But I do know that she didn't like me too much. And I didn't care for her too much. You know, I, I just, um, the way she would try to get me to compete against her in point fighting was, you know, wasn't very polite, wasn't very nice. And I just thought, you know what? I'm not going to do that. You want to step outside and fight? Okay. If you, you're that upset with me, you're that angry with me, or you think I'm, all, you think I'm that little, then go ahead. Let's step outside. But I guess she found that the middle ground, more of a neutral ground. Well, maybe not so neutral. She'd been doing it for two years and I had never done it. And what happened with that fight? Oh, we beat the snot out of each other. And they, um, I mean, literally, she split my lip open, and I'm beating the crap out of her. And it was, it was, uh, it was the bell would ring, and she'd sit down, and I'd be standing there in the middle of the ring going, come on, get up, let's go. Good as bell, sit, get up. <laughs> I was just, <laughs> I was scared to death. I was scared to death. And I wasn't going to let her know that. <laughs> Hell no. So... <clears throat> Um, at the end of the fight, the announcer, because it was her school who put on the event, it was all her, the school, the judges were from her school, the referee was from her school. So, well, no, the referee wasn't from her school. The referee was uh, Peter Cunningham. But <clears throat> at the end of the fight, the announcer gets in. He goes, okay, they're tallying up the scores right now. Give the ladies a good hand. And my coach walks up to him, puts his arm around him, and said, look, your girl weighs 190, my girl weighs 120. You said this was an exhibition. If you announce a winner right now, I'm going to break your arm right here and right now. So the guy changed his tactic. Oh, great exhibition. Give the ladies a hand. He gave us both a trophy, and <laughs> we both went about our way. I can't tell you who won or who lost. It doesn't matter. Um, I discovered a deep, deep love for adrenaline and having it brought up, it putting like myself in situations where uh, extremely dangerous and and loving every second of it. That fight kind of set a path for you. For for competing in kickboxing, it did. Also for hang gliding and skydiving and whatever else scares the crap out of me. Yes. Do you find that when you face those things, hang gliding, skydiving? Does the fear go away and then you move on to find something else? Or are you learning to understand the fear? Well, there's the initial fear of all the things that could possibly happen when you compete, like getting hurt or getting literally killed. This is probably the worst thing that could happen, although I, I would find it welcoming. But <clears throat> um, as far as physically being damaged or hurt or injured for life or Things like that. Those, those are the motivations of the fear, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you go skydiving, your chute doesn't open. Guess what? <laughs> yeah. It's going to be a hard landing, <laughs> right? But that's what makes it so fun and exciting and cliff diving and whatever else. You know? um, I, uh, I, I digress. What was the question? Losing track of what you're asking. So my question was around fear, I, I guess, because I, I don't. I'm not an adrenaline junkie. There are certain things that I'll do that evoke a strong fear response. And I've learned to either, I guess my response is always very kind of academic and cerebral, but I'm guessing that's not you. It sounds like you probably have a more um, energetic approach to fear or a more physical acceptance of fear. I, I don't even know that I can fully form my question. But it sounds like, just in the words that you're using, something changed for you in the way you approach life from this fight. Well, 
um, that that's one of the one of the factors that helped change my perspective. In that, I I know that when I came up through the ranks of Kung Fu Sun Tzu, you know, I became a master in Kung Fu Sun Tzu, and you know, my black belt test I failed nine times because my black belt test was a three day, twenty four seven test. And at any given moment, somebody could have, you know, jump out and attack me from behind a building or walking out of work or getting into my car or whatever the case may be. And on top of that, the, the bazillion things I had to do, write a thesis and, you know, perform forms with blindfolded, with a long weapon, short weapon, double weapons, you name it, create something. There was just so much I had to do. But... <clears throat> Getting to that point, somewhere in the middle, I was reawakened to um, another another very powerful vision of, of how many times I've been here and how many times I've been here as a warrior. And fear doesn't really take a place in it. I mean, I guess fear in my in my case is a motivator and not uh, an in, not a disable concept i'm just considering a transition here that's okay and you know i i guess along those lines i if something's boring i, I typically don't do well or if it's not challenging if it's not something that you know not not necessarily scares me or frightens me but if it's not something that whether it's intellectually or physically or emotionally then i don't tend to do well when you Consider how to spend your time now. What are your priorities? You, you just seem to have this Helping very... others. Okay. Your outlook on, on life is different than I would argue anyone we've had on the show is. So I, I'm at a oh. bit of a loss, and, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but... That's okay. I'm, no, I, I'm I, kind of I searching in how to way. ask some of these questions. Okay, good. So your, your okay. goal is spent in... Your priority in your time is, is helping others. How does that manifest? It manifests itself in, uh, uh, gosh, a myriad of ways. I think I mentioned earlier before the show actually started that I, I am a minister. Not that I go to church. The world is my church. Um, but I, I just, when I say I'm a minister, I don't say, oh, you have to believe in God or you're going to hell. Because <laughs> that doesn't exist. Um, but what does exist is fear or love. And you can choose to operate with fear or you can choose to operate with love. And I hope people see, I hope people understand that there can be a different way of looking at things. There can be a different way to approach things. There can be, like, for example, here's a classic example, literally. Very simple. I, I wanted to meet a friend in West Los Angeles to go to see a movie in the afternoon, it was a matinee showing. I drove to West LA, and you know, in West Los Angeles, parking is a is a monster. It's, <laughs> it's extremely difficult. So, but thankfully, this particular mall had a parking structure, and I think I finally got to the fifth level of the parking structure to find a parking spot. And in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, I'd like to find something really close to the elevator door, so that I have a sense of where it is. Um, so I don't get lost, right? Because I, I didn't know the area very well. Long story short, I see a spot literally right by the elevator door. And I'm thinking, score! So I pull in and I sat down and I thought, well, I'm early. I'll just read for a little bit and, um, and wait until it's time to go down. Right at that moment, a woman knocks on my door and she says, I was waiting for that spot. And I said, oh, you were? She goes, yeah, I was sitting there waiting for it, and you just pulled right in, and you just passed right by me and ignored me. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I pulled out, and I found another parking spot very close by. And I sat and started, pulled out my book again and started to read. Well, that same woman came back to me. She knocked on my window, and I got out of the car this time. And I looked at her, and I said, can I help you? She says, yes, I'm really sorry. I'm sorry that I blew up at you. I'm sorry. I was just really frustrated and was trying to get somewhere in a hurry. And, and I was being really mean and I, I'm so sorry. And I gave her a big hug and she started crying. I said, it's, it's really okay. You know, it's just a parking spot. It's not worth 
it's not worth it. And she said, you're right, it's not. And, and she thanked me and left. Sat back in my car and continued reading until it was time to go. But it's little things like that that turn out to be big things after a while. You spend time working with students in, in a martial arts context now, right? Yes. How, how do these lessons that you've learned outside this, I guess we'll call it ministry, how does that show up in the way that you work with students? Well, I tend to, I mean, I've had, gosh, for so many years I've been teaching. I started to open my first school when I was 19 years old. And, you know, I knew martial arts didn't know how to run a business. <laughs> Learned an awful lot. But um, gosh, ever since then, there have been periods of time when I'll, I'll, students will come to me at a variety of ages, typically young teenagers through, through young adults. Um, not that I haven't had the other spectrum. I've taught a, a, tons of children and tons of older adults as well. But for some reason, that age group seems to gravitate to me. And they confide in me issues that they're having with school or their girlfriend or events that go on in their life. And one student in particular, uh, his I won't say his name, not that anyone's going to know him, doesn't matter, but just in respect of him and his privacy. I won't say his name, but he um, was driving along, him and his brother were driving down the freeway, and a woman crossed the medium and drove straight into them. It was a head-on collision. Thankfully, Ruben, uh, uh, there you go, I just said his name. <laughs> Thankfully, my students had, had the, the presence of mind to react quickly and veer off, and so he didn't take the full damage of the, uh, of the accident, of the head-on collision. <clears throat> He and his brother went to the hospital, and they were checked out, and she went to the hospital, and she was checked out, and, and she admitted that she wanted to kill herself and take someone's life with her. Mm. So he comes to me, and he's the kind of guy that, you know, as a, as a young boy, 15, 16, he was in a mafia type of situation where he was just making money hand over fist and, you know, supporting his family um, paying the mortgage on his mom's house. He had a nice car. He had the nicest clothes. He had whatever he wanted. But, you know, I have since realized that that's not the best way to be and turned himself around. However, in this particular situation, he came to me and he was just really troubled and conflicted because he said, look, you know, if she had she'd wanted to kill herself, she could have just come to me and I would have happily shot her. And I'm looking <laughs> I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, wow, okay. But he hated her so much that he was contemplating finding out where she lived. And I said, you know, you have to understand that there's a reason she chose you. You can see this as random because there are no accidents. You can see this as a random incident in that she just, just decided at that very moment to cross the medium and hit the car that was there because she decided at that moment she wanted to end her life. But there are no accidents. The reason she chose you is because you need to learn from this. At that time, he was going to college to become a minister. And I said, how are you going to respond to somebody who comes to you explaining this very situation? Do you say to him, yeah, go find out where they lived and, and snuff them. And he looked at me and he goes, wow, you're right. What would I say? And I say, you know, it's not that you have to, you know, befriend her, but understand the situation, understand what she was going through, be compassionate enough to know that if somebody really wanted to kill themselves, they must be in a pretty dark place. And the hope that she that you have that she gets out of this is that maybe she finds a, a, another way or she can you know find a reason to to be happier and live and become a better person and when i gave him a hug i guess i mean he told me this afterwards but apparently all the anger and hatred and frustrations just left his body right at that point 
and I wouldn't have had an opportunity to help somebody like that if I hadn't experienced something along those lines myself. Do you ever have... And that, Go ahead, sorry. No, I was just going to say, and that's just scratching the surface of all the plethora of things that I've... Uh, situations that I've gone through in my life. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. It, it's... You know, that's kind of the, the primary thing that I'm hearing right now, is you're kind of operating on a on a different level, I think, than most of us. And that was... My question, do you ever have a hard time connecting with people because you've you've had these experiences and you have this different view on on life in the universe? It's not that I have a different view. I everybody can have the same view. It's what they choose. But as far as answering your question, I connect even more so with people because, you know, I am human. I, I have an ego and it's, it's a continual struggle to, to keep that ego at bay and, you know, try to stop and respond to somebody as opposed to just a knee-jerk reaction to what somebody might be saying or doing. And I, you know, I have to remind myself many, many times all day <laughs> To, to try to see things from their point of view, to see that, yes, you know, they're, they're being a butthead right now, but it's, it's because they're projecting. When you see a, a little toddler, a two-year-old, who does not know how to communicate adequately what they want or what is wrong with them, so instead they throw a temper tantrum because for some reason when they do that, they see that that, has, that seems to get some results, so I'm going to do that. And that's how they train themselves to behave. And it, and it just continues on, or they can choose to see something differently. But at two years old, they don't quite understand. So if I stop and I think, okay, they clearly have had a repetitive, they have this, this constant nature of this is how I'm going to respond to things because this is what I've always gotten. This is how I get what I want. I can't necessarily get mad at them. It doesn't mean I have to be subjected to it. It doesn't mean I have to allow myself to be abused, although I did for many, many years. Um, that's a whole other story. It's something I, I came to understand that I needed to go through in order to put myself where I am today, in order to be the person I am today. But looking back at them, you know, I, I try to be a little more compassionate and see where they're, what they're, where they're coming from and why they're behaving that way. And that tends to be the way the ego works. When you're behaving like a butthead, you think the world is going to shit in a handbasket. But it really isn't. It's just how you're seeing it. What, what are you thinking when you're training? You know, when, when you're, and, and I don't mean necessarily training for a fight, but just general martial arts training. What is going through your mind? Um, okay. That would depend largely on whether I'm learning something or I'm teaching something or I'm just connecting with somebody and working with them. Could you talk about each? Of course. Okay. In, in learning, um, it's not so much about learning the technique, but it's about seeing how and why it works, understanding the, the root of what that technique, quote unquote, would be. When it comes to, I guess, I guess we like to say defend ourselves. Now you put yourself in that situation, and when I'm learning how to defend myself, um, I, I always tend to see the intention behind the attack. Sometimes people are just scared, and they just want money, and, you know, they just want to be cared for. They just want to be loved, but they don't know how to ask for it. Sometimes, um, well, let's go to, uh, 
I guess, I guess in learning something new, which I love to do, I love learning new things. Sometimes I can get lost in the technique of it, but <clears throat> it's connecting with a person where I learn the best. I, I, I don't learn as well in a group situation. I, I learn better one-on-one. Um, not that I can't learn in a group situation. I can, but uh, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of kinetic energy going on in the room and you know, being very aware of it, sometimes I can get distracted. So it's best when I have somebody I'm working with, when I'm learning something, it's best for me when I'm learning with somebody who knows more than I do. Um, and though it may slow them down, uh, we're just learning. And if they're willing to be with me and help me through it, that's great. And I learn better that way because I'm connecting with the person that I'm with. When it comes to teaching, I try to break things down as absolutely as simply as possible so that they all understand how and why something I'm showing them is going to work or not work. I spent two and a half years working in a bar as the lead bouncer in Bakersfield. And it's a beautiful seafood restaurant during the day. And at night, they opened up their bar and they had a dance floor. And because there were not many dance clubs there, all walks of life came there. But the manager was very very intelligent in that he put on, he had a country and western night, he had hip hop night, he had lip syncing contests, he had all kinds of promotions that he would do. So all walks of life came there. And after midnight, not too many got along. <laughs> so, so I got into all kinds of altercations with all kinds of people. Um, and I learned an awful lot. Especially because drunk people are, have gorilla strength and, and a very high tolerance of pain, or they don't feel pain right away. So in teaching, you know, I try to explain to people that if you're going to be attacked, so many factors come into play. So many factors. And, you know, the the situations and the what-ifs are endless, completely and utterly endless. But you can also narrow it down to there's only circular attacks or linear attacks, period. That's it. Whether it's a lower body or upper body or they're moving forward or they're moving around you, it doesn't matter. It's either linear or circular. And once you know how to pick apart the middle, everything else is easy. But that, you know, in saying that, it's because I've spent my entire life learning that. So in teaching, I try to put people in as many different scenarios as, they, as I can, you know, literally getting out of the car or you've got a hurt arm, you can't use it, or you walking in a parking lot or you're, it goes on and on. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, those aren't scenarios that tend to show up in a lot of different schools. We've, we've had uh, Tony Blower on the show and, of course, anyone that knows his body of work knows that he's really fond of, of training those kind of, I would say, atypical martial arts, but yet very typical life situations. Sure. Well, as being well-rounded as possible as a martial artist, it's good for dealing with all kinds of situations. But truthfully, if you're aware and you can feel the intentions of somebody, you can get out of 99.9% of altercations, period. Have you had any scenarios like that that you'd be willing to share? Um, gosh. Sure. Um, I'm trying to find one that would be quickest to explain. There was a, there was a, man, a serial rapist when I was living in Bakersfield at the time. And I guess what he would do was walk around neighborhoods looking for <clears throat> women who lived alone. Now, I didn't live alone, but this particular rapist, serial rapist, would target women who lived alone and case their house as long as possible to see if, when eventually they would leave a window cracked open or a screen undone or something along those lines. And they would crawl, creep into their house and, um, and pin them down and rape them. And 
I he would usually hold them at gunpoint. So it's it's not like I mean if if they didn't know how to disarm him or if they didn't know basic self defense skills they would be in a lot of trouble. And I remember getting out of work late and my car broke and I was walking. I was walking home, which was, you know, quite a few miles, but it didn't matter because it was summer and it was night and it was wasn't it wasn't a bad night. So I was just walking home and I became very aware. You know how you get the the prickly feeling and the hair stand up on the back of your neck and yeah. you just know somebody's there watching you and you don't know where they are but you feel it. Yeah. I had that situation and I'm sort of walking down the street and and I finally I stopped. And I turned around and I looked, and as soon as I turned, he ducked behind a house that he had been casing. And I stood there thinking to myself, hmm, is that the serial rapist? I'm going to go see. But when I went there, um, he wasn't there. I, I went around the corner, I'm walking around the entire house. But I'm feeling kind of weird because I'm walking around somebody's house <laughs> whom I don't know in the middle of the night. So I, I thought, all right, obviously he's hiding. And if I saw him at all, if I was correct in that I did see him, but I decided to keep walking. So I'm walking and I feel it again. And sure enough, I turn immediately and he's right behind me. And I just yelled, what do you want? And he turned and ran. And then? I went home. I mean, I guess he figured, well, I'm casing this woman's house. I haven't been able to get in. Here's another girl walking down the street late at night. It's very possible he was casing that other house. And, and I guess seeing me decided to abandon that and follow me. And just turning around and yelling at him, I, I think he wasn't expecting that. I think he probably would feel would have felt better if he was enclosed in a room where he had control. <clears throat> but I don't think he expected a woman to turn around and yell at him, what do you want? There's a very early in my martial arts training there was a situation where I was walking down the street again late at night. Not that I do that often, I don't, but it was just I couldn't sleep. And I just decided to get up and go for a walk. And in Bakersfield, in the summer, it's still 90 degrees, even at 2 in the morning. It's crazy. Stupid hot. And I'm walking down the street, and this gigantic guy is walking toward me. And I'm looking at him, and I'm scared to death because I'm just a beginning. I'm just a beginner in, white, you know, in martial arts. And I remember my instructor telling me, when you are scared, you square your shoulders, you walk straight ahead, you look them in the eye, you make eye contact, you look at them. And that usually acts as, as a deterrent because they don't want somebody who is confident and will look you in the eye. They don't want to deal with somebody like that. So I did that. And he sees me and he looks me up and down. He goes, hey, baby, you looking for some work? And before I could stop myself, the words were just flowing out. And I said, no, are you looking to get your head stuffed up your ass? And I was so shocked to hear myself <laughs> say those words. And I guess he was just as shocked. And he goes, oh, uh, uh, no, no, uh, sorry. And he took a few more steps and I took a few more steps. I glanced behind my shoulder and I ran home <laughs> as fast as I could run. <laughs> <laughs> there's a bit of a common thread here of, of you rising rising to occasions when uh. when we talk about limits you know one of the first words you used to describe the physical form i mean we were in like minute three of talking about that, that this word had come already come up twice. 
Do you believe in limitations? Well, in that we are in a very limited reality that we've all created, there can be tons of limitations. Like, I, I can't fly, although I could if I decided to, if I chose to. If I really chose to believe that I could, I, I probably can. But, you know, we all believe that gravity is, is such that it keeps us bound here on the Earth. So, do I believe in limitations? You know, I understand that I'm living in limitations at this point, in this physical form, but otherwise, no. How does that affect... Classic. Go ahead. How does it affect? Well... How does, how does it you know, affect your life, your training? Most people go through life seeing these very hard limits. And, and, and I think most martial artists that have trained for even more than a little while see that those boundaries are much broader than a lot of people see them as, you know, a lot of non-martial artists. It's pretty clear to me that you have an even, let's call it, bigger ripple out of where you would draw them. And, and it sounds like you draw them pretty uh, softly. How does that affect your martial arts? It's a martial arts show, so I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it back once in a while. Sure. How, do, how does that how does <laughs> that impact how does that impact your training? Well, I'm I'm 53, going to be 54 in a couple months, and you know I can still run and kick to the head and and hit the bag and spar, and it's I still have fun with that. Um, I'm not at that point where I, I need to, like when I was competing professionally and, and fighting for world championships, I was running 10 miles a day. At, at, at I mean, I, I had to, I literally had to run 10 miles in one hour. I had no choice. That's what, that's what was given to me. And you have to run that. So I accepted that and said, okay, then I will run 10 miles in one hour. And that's what I have to do. I have to do a thousand pushes a day. I have to hit, so many times with as much power as I can on the bag in three minutes, I have to hit so many, like 400 strikes. It's, it's what was given to me. And so I didn't see that as a limitation. It was like, okay, this is what I have to do. Was I able to do it in the beginning? Of course not. But I worked at it and I asked my body to do it and it did. So in 1998, I remember I was boxing professionally and <clears throat> There was a mini belt on the line. It wasn't a world title belt or even a state belt or anything, but it was just a, a little tournament belt for boxing. And I was fighting a girl named Lena Ockeson, a very tall girl, and she was trained by Angela Dundee. And we were in the South, in Louisiana. And I knew that if I didn't knock her out, there's no way that, that I'm going to win this fight if I didn't knock her out. I was there 10 days before the fight, and on the eighth day, two days before the fight, I catch a horrible cold, a really bad cold, and I'm miserable. And I go to the State Athletic Commission, and I said, look, I've got a little bit of a cold. I lied. And I, I said, what am I allowed to take? Because they did drug testing. And I said, I don't want to take anything that's going to interfere or, uh, you know, test, test positive for any kind of in performance-enhancing drugs. So what, what am I allowed and they told me, they gave me a list of over-the-counter medicines that I could take. I took them all, all of them. And when I walked into the fight, my whole body was just buzzing, and I was numb. I didn't feel anything, literally. I could barely think. My mind didn't quite shut down, but it went in autopilot. And, and I fought fought for those four or five rounds or whatever it was for that tournament belt. And when they announced her the winner by unanimous decision, I looked down and I shook my head and I thought to myself, okay, that's it. I'm never getting sick again. Never. And that was in 1998. So it's been 20 years of no colds, no flu, no allergies, no joint pains, no arthritis, no nothing, nothing. Because I decided I don't need to do that. Have you applied the same conviction to accomplishing any of your 
martial arts um, development. You mentioned that you you enjoy learning new things, so I imagine that you are often learning new things. New things are difficult. Yes. No, new <laughs> things are wonderful. They're not difficult. Well, they can be both. Is it challenging? They if can you be prefer that word. Challenging. Okay. Yes. Difficult. No. Have you? It's just a matter of retraining your mind to do the task at hand. We all get into habits. We all form habits, and we all do the same things over and over because we're creatures of habit. That's that's the way we operate. However, <clears throat> when you choose to do something new, you have to let go of those old habits. You have to let go of what you already know. You have to literally walk in with the wonderment of a child and see how wonderful and exciting something new might be. And that is the best way to learn. I'm sorry. You were asking a question. That's okay. Forgive me. I, I, I told you, you know, at the very beginning, and all of the listeners know, at least long-time listeners, the best stuff is on the edges. I've said that before. So I can ask a question. You can give a completely, you can answer a completely different question, and I'm probably still going to be fine with it. <laughs> and that's what's happening <laughs> today. Right. You know, Thank we you. are we are <laughs> wandering. We are all over the place, and I love it. This, Good. If, if I had my druthers, I would say, okay, go, and you would just talk. But of course, that's not really the, the best way to have a conversation, to have an interview. So I don't get to do that. Because right. I, I enjoy okay. this show in the same way that all of the listeners do. At least I hope I do. I started the okay. show that I wanted. You've got to understand something. This is your show. So if it, if it goes a different route, it's still your show. You can that's do whatever right. you want with it. That's right. And what I want is to listen to what my guests like to talk about. Okay. Let's do that. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. What so, goals do you have for yourself? No. What goal? Yeah. You know, I think the best way to put it, I guess, if you were, if I were to, to say this is a goal, would be to help people in a much larger way, you know, in a much more... Um, Look, there's the ripple effect, which we all know happens. If you help one person, if you're, because you never know what's going on through somebody's mind. So it's better to just be kind. It's, it's better to just be nice, no matter what. Just be nice and be kind. Because you have no idea what demons and hells are going through at that personal moment. Um, so in that respect, I, I, one of my goals are to help people in a much larger way meaning more people at once as opposed to necessarily one person at a time. And whether it's by speaking on the radio or it's by uh, doing talks to larger groups or whatever the case may be, that, that is my focus right now. That is my goal. That is my desire to, to help in a, in a larger way, in a larger spectrum. Makes sense. Comes back to one of the first things we talked about: service, serve others. Yes, giving back. Yeah. You know, it, it because look, no matter what's going on, we are all one, and we're all connected to source. And as as when I say we're all connected to source, it's not like there's a there's a cord going between you and me and everybody else that we come in come, come into contact with. It is we are all one. We are all created. By source. And so in that respect, we are. And we can create and we do all the time. Um, because ultimately, when you're helping others, you're also helping yourself. There is no one else in the room. Because we're all one. This has been a lot of fun, and I, I really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing and sharing so deeply. You know, I, I think there 
are people out there that are listening, that are nodding along. And and I'm going to admit, I'm one of them, that might be apprehensive about sharing such core beliefs. I mean, this is... feels like we, we have quite the window into your soul right now. And I appreciate that. And that takes, but, that takes because, uh, guts. Because it is also your soul and their soul and everybody else's soul. And it's not about religion. It's not about tying yourself or limiting yourself to a, a specific belief. You know, just be good. You don't have to be religious. Just be good. Just be kind. Just be helpful to others. And guess what? It'll come back. Mm. No matter what, it'll always come back. You've shared such amazing stuff here today. If people want to find you online, get a hold of you, you know, maybe they're swinging through your area and hoping to drop in on a class or something, how would they, how would they do that? Well, um, they can email me. To, I'm not sure which email I gave you. I have four Gmail accounts. Okay. But, <laughs> it's okay, because this particular one, I, I, I would prefer the masses to use. Sure. It's Kathy Long, EMA, which means Evolving Martial Arts. Kathy Long, EMA, at gmail.com. Okay. And we'll post that. Of course, any new listeners, we post our show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. So if you're driving or something, you don't have to worry about jotting down notes and risking life and limb. I appreciate yeah. everything you've shared here today. This This is one of those that I'm sure quite a few people are going to hit rewind and listen to again. There's just been so much amazing stuff to take away. And I, I just thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. So is your show an hour or is it an hour and a half? Uh, just just about an hour. We, we usually do about an hour. It seems okay. like we were at a, a graceful pa- place. If, if If there's another story you want to send us out with, I would love to hear it. But otherwise we can fade into the night now. No. I think we're good. I think we are too. I really appreciate you. Thank you very much. Coach Cat is undoubtedly a unique individual. She's philosophical, spiritual, and an altogether insightful human being. She's an inspiration to many, both martial artists and non, and that certainly includes me. Thank you, Coach Cat, for your time. If you want to check out the show notes with everything we talked about, links, and a whole bunch more, you can find that at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. If you want to follow us on social media, we are at Whistlekick on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can also find us on YouTube, Tumblr, and a bunch of other places. Sign up for the newsletter. We send that out once or twice a month. Just keep you up to date on what's going on. Sometimes we drop some discounts in there. Really, it's just a, an extension of the show, as are the show notes. And if you want to leave feedback, you can do that on the show notes page at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can do that via social media, or you can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I want to thank you for your time today. Thanks for spending a little bit of time with Coach Cat and I, and I hope that it's had a good impact on your day and tomorrow, and maybe even the day after that. But that's all I've got for today. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. What? Yeah.